In many ways, Australians have never had it so good. This economy is booming, but is it a country at ease with itself? Well, not according to my guest today, the Australian novelist Christos Cholkas. His award-winning and controversial book, The Slap, depicts a suburban Australia disfigured by racism, sexism, and an overwhelming selfishness. He says that he is ashamed of the direction that modern Australia has taken. Why? Christos Cholkas, welcome to Hard Talk. It's a pleasure, Stephen, thank you. Australia was once dubbed the lucky country, but in your fiction, it seems like the unhappy country. Is that fair? It's a, uh, I'm hesitating because it's a, for me, it's a bizarre place, Australia. You know, we are, uh, we're, we're doing this interview uh, in the, still in the middle of the uh, global financial crisis. Where, and um, I was in Europe last year, I was in Greece, so I saw kind of the real effects of what that crisis means, uh, the insecurity and anxieties that, that come from that. And so you, you look at a, uh, a country like Australia, which has been sheltered from that crisis because of a whole intricate uh, history and politics to do with our relationship to, to Asia. Um, so we are the wealthiest that we have ever been. Australians have never had it so good no, materially. No. And that, that, that when I started writing the slap, it was actually trying to, trying to make sense of uh, two things were happening. One was, you know, I, I come from a, a particular background, uh, which I'm really proud of, but in writing, in being educated, in, I, I, I just feel like I'm no longer can claim a, a right to that working class background that, that my parents uh, come from. Because they were working class they were immigrants from Greece. From rural Greece. They were part of the, um, that massive uh, immigration that came uh, to Australia post-World War II um, from, from southern and eastern Europe. Um, and so I'm very conscious of that heritage and I'm very conscious of uh, how my fortune is dependent on, on, on th th those personal histories of my parents. But, um, but I, did, um, I was aware that I'm, I'm part of the middle class, you know, and I hadn't really in my previous work dealt with what that meant. But that's what I um, picked up from the book and from some of the other writings uh, that I've, I've seen of yours. You seem to be uncomfortable with the middle class that you've entered. I mean, one phrase that I just stuck in my mind from you, you talk about the crevices and the dark spaces of the Australian suburban landscape. Australians, we tell ourselves we are egalitarian. We tell ourselves that we are larrikins. We tell ourselves that we are, she'll be right, mate, that we will, that we're accepting. And, uh, um, and over the 90s and the early part of the 21st century, I thought we were the most selfish that I've ever seen, that we're the most uh, grasping and greedy and xenophobic and unkind. Uh, that, that we've ever been. And That's I, a heck of a damning I, I think it's very statement true. about your yeah. own people, the people you live amongst. I resist that idea that um, being part of a, a people, being part of a nation, is that you can't see yourself clearly. Uh, growing up in a migrant uh, household, there was always the romance I had, uh, this place called Greece, and also this place called Europe that, that you're a part of, um, that I could escape to that, but that's really where it came from. Took three or four visits to Europe to put that that idea to rest. I'm not European. I am, for better or worse, or for whatever. This is what I am. I'm you Australian. are Aussie, for I'm good a, or real. So I wanted to really have a look at at who we are, what we've been doing, what we've become, and that's that's where the slap emerged from. That's that's what I wanted to write. And I don't think that I have. I think it's a harsh thing to say, but I don't think it's an untrue thing to say. I love reading contemporary fiction, and I, I read a lot of it, but I don't think I've ever come across a book that where so many of the main protagonists, the, the voices through uh, whom the story is developed and, and, and narrated, are so utterly unlikable, even despicable. Lots of people have said that to me about the characters in the book, and I don't think that... 
I, I, I certainly don't think of that about Manolius, who is the, the old man in the book. Yeah, Manolius has got... Um, Manolius is the Greek uh, father of, of one of the main characters. He himself appears quite a lot, but it's really his, his son who is one of the, the, the central, central protagonists, characters. really, if you like, in the book. But I think Manolius... Look, he's got... Yes, he's got incredibly sexist attitudes. Most of the men in the book are misogynists. I would, I would say that one of the things about being a man, for me in the culture, is uh, being aware of your slide into misogyny, uh, of your... Uh, and it's not only on the level of making sexist comments or sexist assumptions, it's actually... Um, fear or hatred of women, you know, kind of having to be conscious of that. There's violence in the book and some of the sex, a lot of the sex actually is written, uh, as some critics have said, in quite a pornographic way. Was that deliberate? Yeah, because um, I was really surprised by the poverty of a lot of that cri criticism. I was really surprised that they would not acknowledge that pornography is one of the ways I'll speak for myself as a man that I am, that I am sexual in the culture. I mean, I can't avoid it. Um, pornography. It's there on the internet. It's, it's on the screens. It's in. It's infect, infected. And I'll use that word the way I, I look at sex. I mean, the slap isn't isolated from my other work. I think right from the beginning. And maybe that has to do with, with being homosexual and growing up in a in, in a culture like this. So on one, you know, on one hand, a very traditional Greek, uh, patriarchal culture. Uh, where it felt, it just felt impossible to be a faggot, to be really blunt in it. Like that. well, <laughs> that's, you, that's, that's you, one you, thing. If you are honest, is that the way your own father and your own family would have viewed a homosexual, as a faggot? Yes, I don't, I don't think, I, I remember coming out to mum, uh, for example, and uh, I was in, you know, on the cusp of my 20s, and, you know, I was 20 and um, I'd been living away from home for a while and she, was, she just was trying to understand why I had cut myself off from, from the, the family. And I, I had to turn to her and say, look, I'm, I'm gay. But I didn't actually know the Greek word for gay. And she, I don't, she doesn't know the, she didn't know what the word meant, gay meant back then. So I had to say, I'm a pusti, you know, I'm a, I'm a fag. That's, um, and that was the only language I had for it. I don't, in saying that, I don't, you know, I think my parents have made a remarkable journey as I, as I have, I think there's great dignity and there's great courage in their unrelenting support for me. But it was incredibly, there was no way, I didn't understand how to be male, how to be a man and be gay. It just didn't make sense to me. That, that you, was a long struggle. And do you think it is because you are a gay Australian that you are able to take a, a particular, maybe a more detached view of what is going on with the majority, the Australian heterosexual manhood? Because of my sexuality, and I'm talking, you know, 25 years ago, because of my sexuality and because of being, you know, uh, to be blunt, a wog in this culture, an outsider in the culture. Well, we'll, that we'll have to address me, that word in a minute too. That gave me a perspective, an outsider's perspective, an inside-outsider perspective, and I think that is incredibly valuable for a writer. Is it different in Australia? You say, I, you know, you said to me, I, I am a wog. What, what on earth do you mean by that? Uh, wog was what uh, you were called. That was what my parents were called. That was like the derogatory term that um, because people... Because they were, they were uh, olive-skinned immigrants from the Mediterranean. Yeah, that, and you've got to understand that there is, a, you know, for, for a long time in this country, uh, and I... I was born at a time when it hadn't gone away. There was a white Australia policy. Mm. You know, it was about Australia was going to, one, we were going to uh, deny a whole racial history built on the um, dispossession of the indigenous people here. That's, and we still haven't, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why race politics continues to be so difficult and so confronting for Australians, is we still haven't resolved that in any meaningful way. And I look across the sea to New Zealand, where I'm not, I'm not, trying to be romantic about it but I think they've got a, I've gone a much uh, they have a much better relationship between indigenous and but settler. in your lifetime Kevin things have changed enormously I mean, Kevin, have, Kevin Rudd's government issued the formal apology uh, you talk to young Australians on the streets and they will say that it it, it, it feels different now 
and, and uh, this government has recommitted itself to a specific multicultural strategy for this country. It, it has, just now, after a long period of um, making the word multicultural a very, very dirty word. Both parties, both, you know, both the, the Liberal and the Labor parties in Australia had um, had shied away. I just want to be clear about this. Are you suggesting, and it feeds into my original question about your view of Australia, whether it's an angry and unhappy country, are you saying that, that Australia today is still dogged by racism? I think Australia is still dogged by fear of the other and racism, yes. And look, you know, Stephen, I also think your country is. I also, I, I know Greece is. I mean, you know, what, what was... What was the, the major thing I heard on, uh, from Greeks when I was over there was the fear of the immigrant. Yeah, the but, fear but of the, 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 the difference, Christos, is that um, Greece obviously is an ancient culture with an ancient tradition. Britain's a pretty old established culture too. This is a country built by immigrants. In a way, it is more paradoxical and, and for outsiders stranger for you to sit before me in Sydney and say, this country's dogged by racism when it is full of immigrants. Everybody's come from somewhere else pretty much except the Aboriginal community. It is a, a contradiction, but I think it is real. I am going to be harsher about Australia because it's my place and it's the place I know and it's the place where I'm going to live and it's the place where I'm going to die. So I, you know, uh, I want to stake my claim to, uh, in this country as a, uh, both as a writer and as a, uh, as a, as a man living here. Um, I have my own observations to make about other places in the world. Um, but I do fear that racism is a sore, as I said before, that, hasn't, that, that we haven't dealt with properly in this country. But it's a tough place to be, to be inside your own country and to, as you've said, because of your sexuality, because of your ethnicity, to be an outsider from the very get-go, and then to be so public in your critique of the way your society works. It makes you, doesn't it, very lonely, it makes you very isolated. Um, I don't feel like that at all. I actually feel like I'm part of a, uh, in, my, in my life, and I have a, uh, such a solid relationship, such a solid family, such a solid uh, network of friends. So I don't, I think maybe that gives you a certain freedom <laughs> to, to express things. I think it's important to keep keep demanding of Australians that we're better, that we get better, and that we get better at dealing with um, our racial and immigrant history. Um, One because, mm. yes, you talk to people on the streets and uh, you say that, you know, we are better at dealing with in, um, Aboriginal people and Aboriginal history. Yes, Kevin Rudd made the apology, and I was, I was at the Aboriginal Advancement League in Melbourne when that apology was made. And I, I will never forget that day and how moving that day was and how important that day was. Um, but the, 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 the reality is on the ground, Aboriginal people are dying much younger than we settler Australians are dying. They're still living in unbelievable squalor and poverty. Those things haven't changed. And, you know, I was just, uh, just coming to this interview, I was reading that you know, over half, uh, they were doing a poll and ha over half of the population of Sydney um, are uh, expressing pre uh, racism against Muslims and they don't want Muslims to, to, to come into the country. So things have, things have changed, things always do change. I'm just, I think there was a slide backwards. If you had spoken to me in the early 90s, I would have been much more buoyant about this, this this place called the country, uh, Australia. I'd, I'd come back from Europe and I'd come back going, thank God I'm, I'm, I'm here. The, uh, at that time, Europe to me was, and I think in lots of ways it still is, um, uh, obsessed with class in a way that we don't have it here. And that's probably one of the things I do really like about this country. But um, I thought that, yes, we were multicultural. I thought that we were an immigrant nation that was proud of that heritage. And then in 15 years, that all evaporated. Well, that's what it seems seem like to me. And that's what I wanted to write about. In, in a way, it's where your book, The Slap, overlaps with current reality, because what we see today in the Australian political debate is that race has become absolutely the most 
heated, the most divisive issue on the political agenda. And, and on the right wing of Australian politics, we've got shadow cabinet members who are railing against government tax dollars being used to pay for the funerals of those people killed in the, the Christmas Island boat smash. We've got other uh, figures in the opposition coalition saying that Islam is a, is a totalitarian ideology. Do you worry about what you're hearing right now in the political debate? I, I, I it was just the other, the, the other week when there were the images of uh, the, the refugees um, burying their dead. Um, and then I heard, uh, you know, uh, a liberal politician saying that we shouldn't be paying to fly those people to the, to the funeral. And to, you know what, I felt such a disgust and hatred for a moment with this country. I just want, uh, yeah, I just wanted to be out of here. Maybe growing up in the shadow of racism just means that I'm, maybe I'm overly <laughs> aware of it. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm too quick to, to see it. That's, that's possible, I think that is possible. But I really had to fight that, that, that moment of hatred. I really had to fight thinking I, I am disgusted with my country. And a, that is a, I, I don't want to live in that feeling because this is the only place no. I've got. I can't go back to Greece. I can't go back to, to Europe. What about reception for the book that's being turned by the ABC, the main broadcaster, state broadcaster in, in Australia, it's being turned into a, a eight part TV fiction. Um, sold enormously well. What kind of reaction has it pr prompted in this country? One of the things I'm really conscious of is a sense of relief that someone is describing uh, an urban Australia that actually looks and sounds like Australia, the Australia we live in. Uh, not some kind of fantasy of London or New York or mm. Paris or that, that that's that's Australian that you know that Australians are people like me um, and I think that I think that partly partly explains not completely but partly explains some of the success of the book I think yeah that there's a, a, a relief and, and what does the book describe it describes a, a new middle class that is as much Greek as it is Scottish that is as much Lebanese as it is um, English, that is as much Vietnamese or Chinese as it is Welsh. I mean, I think that's that's the real reality of the day, of the world I do move in. Melbourne almost feels like a country <laughs> in mm. itself sometimes. Like I feel quite comfortable in Melbourne, um, and maybe there are, I think there are spaces in Australia which are that old Australia, which is, and I think some of the resentment that has been expressed about the book or some, about some of the anger um, expressed about the book has to do with the fact that that, older, that old Australia doesn't recognise itself in it. And mm. I, make, I, I make no apologies for that. Did you want to reach out to that old Australia? Do you want to reach out to them, to find a way of communicating with them? It would be an astonishing hubris, really, to, 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 to think that I can do that. What gives me pleasure is writing. Mm. So that's what I'm going to do. And if I have any effect, it can only come through the writing. And I don't, I mean, I think a lot of people will read the slap and they will go, this is really vulgar. This is really, I mean, I'm not interested in these people. I, and what I'm hoping is that there will be some audience out there that will respond to the honesty in the book. It strikes me that the two characters who are most decent, who offer the most hope in your book, are the two youngest main characters, the teenagers, Connie and Richie. Is that because you invest, for this country itself, a huge amount of hope in the coming generation? Is that where you see Australia's best hope? In the main, I see I, I, do, I do get hope from seeing how young kids interrelate with one another, that they take a multicultural, multi-ethnic life for granted and they live it on a street level, on a home level, 
on a friendship level, on a love level, in a way that I think uh, was not possible for, for me and my generation. And that, in short, is the Australia you want That's to exactly believe right. in. They also don't have a, my generation's self-righteousness, and that's something I really respect about a generation younger than myself. Final thought, are you writing new fiction about contemporary Australia? Uh, I'm in the middle of a novel and, uh, you know, touch wood, <laughs> you, whenever you talk about it. Uh, I'd be a, a, an idiot to, to I've said this a few times, but I feel like so fortunate I'd be an idiot to, uh, to complain about success. You know, it's what we, you know, it's, it's that, that little dream that I've had for, for so long. But well, I get the sense you're about to say something negative about success. Just that it can be, uh, you can get quite dizzy. You can, I mean, I've been writing for a long time now and I, I really didn't sit down to write a bestseller. That wasn't what I wanted to do. And, I, and it took me a long time to start this next novel because I was scared. I was scared about what were my, what's, uh, what were my, my mo motives, you know? Did I, was this a book I wanted to write from, because I wanted to write this book, or was it because I wanted to follow the the slap, mm. you know? That there, suddenly I had a blueprint for for um, a bestseller. Well, to put it bluntly, your first books had not sold terribly well. Some people had loved them, but they hadn't sold very well. Suddenly you have a bestseller which goes international. And I wonder if there's a part of you that thinks, I've got to repeat that. I've got to get the sales even higher. I could become a major international literary figure. <laughs> you must have heard this before, right? There, there, there are those moments when you sit at the desk and you're writing and you're going, oh my God, I'm a, I'm a genius. <laughs> I'm up there. You know, no one is writing like this. And then, and then just as often where you go, I'm going to be revealed for the fraud I am <laughs> any, any moment now. The, the next book is about a swimmer. Um, um, and it's actually about a swimmer who fails in his um, Olympic dreams. And part of that is because I want to deal with those questions of failure and success. Is there a fear that you might be the writer who strives, has some success, and then fails? Yes. Yeah, of course there is. Of course there is. I mean, that will never go away. I doubt that it goes away for, for anyone, no matter how successful they are. But yes, that is a fear. And so, uh, you know, so I guess with this novel, I'm, I'm thinking, well, let me, let me deal with that, that fear head on. Let me, let me take it on and see where, where that gets me. Christos Cholkas, thanks very much for being on Hard Talk. Thanks very much, Stephen.